Today at 6, Boris Johnson warns the crisis over Ukraine could be entering its most dangerous phase. He was speaking on a high-level visit to NATO headquarters in Brussels. Russia today began new war games on Ukraine's border. I know that in the Kremlin uh, and across Russia, uh, they must be wondering whether it is really sensible to expend the blood of uh, Russian soldiers in a, in a war uh, that I think is, uh, would be catastrophic. Later, meeting troops in Poland, more trouble back home with criticism from a former prime minister over Downing Street parties. Day after day, the public was asked to believe the unbelievable. Ministers were sent out to defend the indefensible. We'll have the latest also on the programme. Prince Charles is self-isolating, testing positive for COVID. He met the Queen two days ago at Windsor. Detained in hospital for more than 20 years, the woman fighting to bring her autistic brother back home. After collapsing on the pitch during the Euros, Christian Eriksen prepares for his Brentford debut, lucky to be alive. I mean, I was gone, what I've heard from, uh, from uh, this world for five minutes until they, uh, they got my heartbeat back. And the Russian figure skater caught up in doping allegations at the Winter Olympics. And coming up on the BBC News Channel, no medals for Britain as yet in the Winter Olympics. But Eve Muirhead's team show some fights to hammer Sweden in the women's curling. Good evening and welcome to the BBC News at Six. Boris Johnson has warned that the crisis over Ukraine is probably at its most dangerous moment so far. As tens of thousands of Russian troops take part in military exercises in Belarus, close to Ukraine's northern border, the Prime Minister, on a visit to NATO headquarters in Brussels, says intelligence assessments remain grim. But the West is pursuing a policy of strong deterrence and patient diplomacy. He then travelled to Poland, meeting some of the British troops recently deployed there. But issues back home have dogged his trip, with the former Prime Minister, Sir John Major, saying that attempts to excuse the breaking of lockdown rules in Downing Street are undermining trust in government and politics at home and abroad. Well, our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, is live in Brussels for us this evening. Laura. Clive, there's no question about just how seriously the British government is taking the threat to Ukraine. There's no question about how much all of the countries who are part of this alliance, NATO based here in Brussels, representing the West, want to avoid a conflict. But there's nothing straightforward about trying to confront or handle a leader like Vladimir Putin. Nothing straightforward about trying to contain the threat to Europe's eastern fringe. Boris Johnson has been here and traveling to other European capitals but there are no easy answers at the end of this day of diplomacy. Is the West walking towards a war on the edge of Europe as the Russian leader dangles obvious danger to Ukraine? Could conversations, diplomacy and candor about the risk slow down a slide to conflict? The Prime Minister has promised the NATO chief another thousand troops to help with a humanitarian effort if the worst comes to pass. The stakes are very high and this is a very dangerous moment and at stake are the rules that protect every nation every nation big and small the number of russian forces is going up the warning time for a possible attack is going down nato is not a threat to russia but we must be prepared for the worst Prime Minister, how much further are you prepared to commit the UK on top of what's already happening? Would you, for example, in the case of an invasion, give UK military support to some kind of insurgency? Uh, you know, the, the Ukrainians are well prepared. There, there are things that uh, we've offered that they, in fact, don't seem to, to need. It's possible, I don't want to rule this out, but uh, at the moment we think that the package is, uh, is, is the right one. On top of pressure abroad, this pressure at home. The Prime Minister, one of those who could be interviewed and fined over breaking lockdown laws. What then? 
if you were found to have broken the law, would you resign? That process must be uh, completed, and I'm looking forward to it being uh, completed, and, and that's the time to, to say more on, on that. But while he grapples with the standoff, Downing Street has been distracted. Fantastic. Boris Johnson met UK troops in Warsaw, who've been helping on Poland's border. But he's had to hire new troops in number 10 to try to calm the chaos. Someone who's held the same photo opportunities as Prime Minister has long been a critic, but now condemns the Prime Minister himself. At number 10, the Prime Minister and officials broke lockdown laws. Brazen excuses were dreamed up. Day after day, the public was asked to believe the unbelievable. Warning the chaos at home has consequences abroad. Their reputation overseas has fallen because of our conduct. We are weakening our influence in the world. But the Labour leader in Brussels for his own meeting is trying to maximise his influence. You know, I've got plenty of arguments with the Prime Minister on many things, particularly in recent months. But when it comes to Russian aggression, uh, we stand as one in the United Kingdom because there's nothing Russia wants more than to see division in the United Kingdom between the political parties. You say now that Labour is the party of NATO. How did you sit alongside Jeremy Corbyn for so long when he had a very different view? He was wrong about that. Um, and I spoke out at the time and said he was wrong about that. But you were part of his front bench team. You ran on a ticket to make him prime minister. And when on this most fundamental of issues, the country's security, you're saying all along you thought he was wrong. Well, he was wrong about NATO, but it's very important to me. This is my first chance as leader of the Labour Party to come here and to, to deliver a very important message. The Labour Party's support for NATO is unshakable. Fine words on these stages, perhaps but miles from the cold threat on the edge of this continent. Western leaders cannot predict, yet hope to prevail. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Brussels. Well, Russia's military exercises with its close ally, Belarus, are due to last 10 days as diplomatic efforts to avert an invasion of Ukraine continued in Moscow with a visit by the Foreign Secretary, Liz Truss. She's warned Russia that continued aggression would lead to severe consequences. That led to a chilly atmosphere at the news conference later held with her Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov. He said their talks had been disappointing and he accused the West of hysteria. In recent weeks, Russia has massed well over 100,000 troops, along with tanks and artillery, on the border with Ukraine. Our correspondent Steve Rosenberg has more from Moscow. For Liz Truss, the day began by the Kremlin, at the tomb of the unknown soldier. A sign of respect for Russia, before the difficult diplomacy. She's only been Foreign Secretary five months. Sergei Lavrov's been in the job 18 years. We cannot ignore the build-up of over 100,000 troops on the Ukrainian border. On the situation in Ukraine, they were never going to see eye to eye. The conversation we had was like a deaf person talking to someone who's mute. We were listening to one another, but not hearing each other. It's Moscow's military activity near Ukraine that's causing concern in the West, like joint drills involving Russia and Belarus. But Mr Lavrov insisted Russia has no plans for an invasion. So we need to see those words from Sergei Lavrov translated into action of de-escalating and moving those troops away from the border. There's a problem here, though, isn't there? Because how do you expect the Russians to take that message seriously, the message that you're delivering, when back home there's a prime minister who is fighting for his political survival? And the Russians know that very well. Well, the prime minister is doing a fantastic job. And we've delivered on the COVID vaccine. We're now opening up the economy post-COVID. There was a headline in the Russian government paper this week, Goodbye Johnson, it said. That must be a distraction. We haven't discussed that at all today. And this is what Russian state TV's been saying about Liz Truss. It's called her clueless and incompetent. I think when people resort to personal attacks is when they have no good political argument to make. 
This was the first visit by a British Foreign Secretary to Moscow for more than four years. Is that called soft power? But after a day of very public disagreements, UK-Russian relations feel as frosty as ever. Steve Rosenberg, BBC News, Moscow. Let's get the view from Ukraine. Our diplomatic correspondent, Paul Adams, is in the capital, Kiev. Um, Paul, troops on the border, military exercises beginning today. That must sour the mood where you are. You know, Clive, the, the government here regards what the Russians are doing as a kind of what the president, Vladimir Zelensky, called psychological pressure. His defense minister was a bit blunter. He called it blackmail. Blackmail against Ukraine to accept Russia's terms for peace with the separatist east of the country. Blackmail to abandon any thought of ever joining NATO, even though everyone knows that's a very remote prospect anyway. And pressure perhaps even to bring the country crashing in on itself, but also pressure on the West to have a dialogue about European security on Russia's terms. And from Vladimir uh, Putin's perspective, you know, the prospect, the sight of Western leaders and officials beating a path to the Kremlin uh, must give him the belief that he's onto something. Now, the West, for all its firmness about the NATO's future, about Ukraine's sovereignty and all the rest, has expressed a willingness to have a conversation about what's sometimes called the security architecture of Europe and essentially how NATO and Russia behave towards each other in the future. And I think President Macron of France even said uh, that the, that would involve correcting some of the mistakes of the past. On those drills in Belarus, which began today and are due to last for 10 days, what happens when they end? Will the troops and the equipment go home or go somewhere else around Ukraine's border? If they do leave the picture altogether, will that be seen finally as some small sign of a de-escalation? But again, think about it from the Kremlin's perspective. Why would you release the pressure on Ukraine now when you appear to be, having, to be gaining the advantage on the wider diplomatic front? OK, Paul, thank you. Paul Adams there live in Kiev. Clarence House says the Prince of Wales has tested positive for COVID-19. Prince Charles received the result this morning. Our royal correspondent, Nicholas Witchell, is here. What more do we know, Nick? Routine test this morning, positive, so Charles is self-isolating. Now, second time he's had COVID, it was right at the start of the pandemic in March 2020 that he had it first. He's triple vaccinated. I think we can assume that he's uh, coping with it OK. But... Two days ago, on Tuesday, he was at Windsor for an investiture and he met the Queen. She had got back from Sandringham the day before. Now, as ever, Buckingham Palace says the absolute minimum about anything to do with uh, health. Uh, all royal sources will say is that the Queen is showing no symptoms of COVID. They won't say whether she's had a test or whether that test was positive or negative. The situation is being monitored. Also, of course, Prince Charles has met a number of other people over the past 48 hours. Last night, for example, he was at the British Museum at a function for the British Asian Trust, and he met a number of people there, among them the Chancellor Rishi Sunak and the Home Secretary Priti Patel. Meanwhile, the Duchess of Cornwall, who was also at that function at the British Museum last night, now she tested negative in a routine test this morning. She continued then, therefore, with her engagements today. So, in summary, Charles positive, self-isolating, the Queen showing no symptoms, the situation is being monitored. OK, Nick, thank you. Nick Witchell there. New figures show a record number of patients were facing long waiting times for hospital beds last month. NHS England says 122,000 people, a third of those visiting A&E, who were all unwell enough to need a hospital stay, waited over four hours in January. Is the latest sign of the strain on the health service this winter. Students and teachers in Scotland's secondary schools will no longer need to wear face masks in classrooms from the end of this month. The First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, says the change will take effect from February the 28th, when all schools have returned from the half-term break. Face coverings will still be required in other communal and indoor areas within high schools, but this will be kept under regular review. Wales's First Minister Mark Drakeford has tested positive for coronavirus and is self-isolating. It comes on the eve of the release of his latest review of coronavirus legislation. 
The Economy Minister, Vaughan Gething, will now lead tomorrow's news conference on any proposed changes to Wales's COVID rules. Last month, BBC News revealed there were 100 people with learning disabilities and autism who had been detained in a hospital for more than 20 years. Since then, several people across the UK have been in touch regarding their own battles to have loved ones released. Our correspondent Jane McCubbin has been to Northern Ireland to meet a woman who's been fighting for 34 years to bring her brother home. It's a journey I will never forget. There was a lot of crying, there was a lot of weeping and wailing. This was the journey which broke Brigine's family. My mother was in the back of the ambulance and I was with her and the ambulance crew were trying to prevent Brian from hurting himself. 34 years ago, this was the journey which took her brother to the hospital where he is still detained today. He hasn't moved other than to move to a different ward. He's still within the walls of the same place. You needed help, yeah. you needed support. He did need help, but he also needed to come home whenever he was ready to come home, which hasn't happened. I've travelled to Northern Ireland to meet Bridgie. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, hello. One How of thousands today? of families across the UK fighting to bring a loved one home. <laughs> That's our Brian. <laughs> We've all now got a copy of that in everybody's house. He's still in part, part of the family. So Between his mum and seven siblings, Brian had originally thrived. At that stage, he couldn't even sit up without support. They'd helped him navigate a world which often fails people with autism and learning disabilities. But as Brian turned 21, life changed for them all. Increasingly unable to cope, he was detained under the Mental Health Act. They were told he'd be back here in 12 weeks. 34 years since he went into the hospital and 25 years since the doctors said he was fit for discharge, Brian is still sitting in the hospital. It's a quarter of a century. It's a quarter of a century. You all stayed close because you all knew you needed to be here when Brian came home. We always kept hoping and thinking that he was going to be able to come home. But Brian can only leave with the right community support. Today, they launch a judicial review to force authorities to provide that. Mostly his whole adult life has been spent in a hospital. And that hospital is Muckamore Abbey. The hospital at the heart of the largest abuse investigation in the history of the NHS. To date, over 70 staff have been suspended. Brian is non-verbal. He can't communicate through speech. People who can't speak up for themselves, people who can't defend themselves. It's so awful. I just... Uh... A public inquiry has opened. I can't. Brigine will be her brother's voice. Belfast Health and Social Care Trust said no one should call a hospital their home, but due to the complex care needs of many long-term patients, resettlement can be challenging. For Brigine, it isn't complex. It's simple. Brian needs to be home. Brian has been deprived of the love of his family. One day, she hopes she will make this journey for the very last time. We never give up. As long as we live, we will keep on trying to get Brian to a place where he can live the rest of his life in peace and happiness. No, never give up. Jane McCubbin, BBC News. It is 18 minutes past six. Our top story this evening. As he meets British troops in Poland, Boris Johnson warns the crisis over Ukraine could be entering its most dangerous phase. And coming up, insulating Britain, why two-thirds of our homes need better protection. Coming up in Sports Day on the BBC News Channel, Sebastian Vettel says F1's removal of taking the knee before races isn't progress. We speak to the Aston Martin racing driver at the launch of their new car for the upcoming season. It was a terrifying moment when the Danish footballer Christian Eriksen collapsed during his side's Euro 2020 game against Finland last summer. He'd suffered a cardiac arrest. Now he's back, having signed for Brentford in the Premier League after having a cardioverter defibrillator implant. The device will restart his heart should it stop again. In an exclusive interview, he's been speaking to our sports editor, Dan Rowan. 
They were the shocking scenes that left football fearing the worst. The cardiac arrest suffered by Christian Eriksen during last summer's Euros was among the most distressing moments the sport has witnessed. But with the world watching on, the Denmark star survived. And eight months on, he's now been handed the chance of a remarkable return with Brentford. Fresh from training and in his first interview since signing for the Premier League club, he told me just how much it meant to be back doing what he loves. But it's going to be very special to be here. To be able to walk out on the pitch and play a, a match uh, again, yeah, it's gonna be uh, gonna be amazing. After you touch the ball again, you get the feeling back, you get the adrenaline, you get the excitement um, back. Yeah, it's uh, it's been some tough months, but uh, I'm happy where I am now. With his partner Sabrina watching on and teammates forming a protective shield, Eriksson was saved by the swift actions of medics who managed to revive him through CPR and a defibrillator. I mean, I was gone. What I've heard from. Uh, from uh, this world for five minutes until they uh, they got my heartbeat back. Can you remember what happened in the seconds before that collapse? I do remember everything on the, the throwing, uh, the ball hitting my knee, and then uh, then obviously I don't know what happened after. And then I wake up with uh, with people around me. Uh, I feel the pressure on my on my chest, trying to to get my breathing back. And uh, and then I wake up, see my open my eyes, and I see people all around me. Uh, didn't really understand what's going on. And what did you think at that moment when you realised what had happened? We well, yeah, still didn't believe it. I didn't believe that was me. How fortunate do you think you are? For me, it was uh, unlucky in a lucky place. And the doctors there to save me that quickly. So, um, yeah, like before, I'm really grateful they were in that place. Has it changed you as a man? Given uh, no, I do think I see my family in a different view compared to what I, I loved my family before, but even now I think I love them more. In seven years at Spurs, Eriksen established himself as one of the world's best midfielders. But he had his contract at Inter Milan cancelled as he's now fitted with a small heart starting device that doesn't allow him to play in Italy. But having trained since December, he's confident his fairy tale return with Brentford can prove a success. For me, of course, obviously, when it happened and the first few days after, I didn't think about playing again, um, of course, because I didn't know what was going on and I wanted to to get all the tests done and get to talk with all the doctors and see what's a possibility and what is not. Um, but then ever since, after <coughs> I think less than a week, then they said, yeah, we have an ICD, but uh, otherwise nothing has changed. You can continue like a normal life and uh, there's no limits to what you want to do. Is it sometimes hard to believe still what did occur that day? Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's a, it's a bit out of the world experience, weird, because it actually uh, did happen and I was where I was, but uh, and then to see where I'm now, then it's, uh, it's very weird. The Danish footballer there, Christian Eriksen, speaking to our sports editor, Dan Rowan. The head of the Metropolitan Police says she expects to be held to account for her leadership. Yesterday, the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, said Dame Cressida Dick had days and weeks to show she could restore public confidence in the force. It comes after several recent incidents and a report found officers at one police station had displayed racism, sexism, misogyny and homophobia. Dame Cressida told the BBC the problems couldn't just be blamed on a few rogue officers. £290 million package of support has been announced in Scotland to help people affected by the soaring cost of living. The Scottish Finance Secretary, Kate Forbes, confirmed there'll be £150 council tax rebates for people living in bands A to D. She said the money will either be given as a direct payment by councils or used as credit towards council tax bills. Government figures show 19 million homes in the UK are in need of better insulation, with two in every three leaking heat. The chief advisor on climate change says ministers must do better and that insulation is the way out of the current energy crisis. The UK is believed to have some of the oldest and draftiest housing stock in Europe. Here's our climate editor, Justin Rowlatt. So you've got lots of heat coming out of this window here. And again, under this window upstairs, we've probably got a radiator here. That's money coming through your wall. We're hunting for drafty homes using this thermal camera. And it is easy pickings here in Manchester. Virtually every home has insulation issues. Let's, you see, you can't really see the roof. And here is the difference insulation can make. But how would you rate this house? This house is definitely losing less heat, especially from the weak spots that we identified on the other houses. 
but just look what it took to give the house an insulation makeover. So there's insulation inside the room here, the windows are double glazed, and the space under the floors insulated too. Up here at the top of the house, the entire roof area has been insulated as well. So the walls used to look like this, bare brick, but they put in this wood fibre insulation, external insulation, and the windows are double glazed. In monetary terms, it saved 40% of our gas on uh, the heating, and it made a really big difference to the comfort of the house as well. But here's the rub. Even at current energy prices, it'll still take at least 20 years to cover the 36 grand it cost. Down in London, it's this man's job to mark the government's homework on climate. So how is it doing? Well, it's a D. Could do much better, I think. So that is something for the government to think about. So I think the government's policy on insulation has been very, very ineffective. It really is very poor. We need something that dramatically changes the number of installations that we do today. So this year we will be in the tens of thousands of installations. We really need to scale that up to something more like half a million a year and to do that quickly over the next four or five years. But if it's hard for middle-class homeowners to afford insulation, it's even tougher for local authorities like Blackpool. Energy-efficient homes are popular with tenants, though. Perfect. <laughs> but it would cost £125 million to bring all Blackpool's social housing up to the standard of Jean's perfect flat. And the council says it simply can't afford it. So what does Britain's climate chief think the government should do? We know that we need a sharper incentive for most people to make these investments in improving the energy efficiency of the home that they live in. For most people, the payback for that will be several years, so the government really does need to step in. So when you ask why so few homes in Britain are well insulated, here is the answer. It's just so expensive. Without some help, most of us will find it tough to get it done. Justin Rowlatt, BBC News, Blackpool. At the Winter Olympics in Beijing, the medals for the team figure skating competition are still to be handed out more than three days after the event. Olympic officials say there's an ongoing legal issue after Russia's skaters won gold. There are now reports one of the team tested positive for a banned substance. Laura Scott has more from Beijing. She's the teenage sensation who's taken the figure skating world by storm. Now, Camilla Valieva appears to be at the centre of one. Three days ago, the 15-year-old made Olympic history, landing a quadruple jump, helping the Russian Olympic Committee to gold in the team event. Camilla Valieva! But the medal ceremony still hasn't taken place, and unconfirmed reports in the Russian media say the reason is that Valieva has tested positive for a banned substance. The authorities are remaining tight-lipped on the subject. There's a legal issue going on. I can't say anything more than that. At the moment, it's speculation. I can't comment. I think we have to wait. Sorry, we have to wait with patience for this case to be to, to find its way to con some kind of conclusion. Because Valieva is under 16, she wouldn't have to be named if she were charged with an anti-doping rule violation, and her coaches and entourage would automatically be investigated for any potential involvement. Earlier, her teammates weren't in the mood to talk. Sorry, no comments. Well, the very presence of Russian athletes at these games had already been a source of controversy, given the country is still serving sanctions for a state-sponsored doping programme. The athletes are appearing under the banner of the Russian Olympic Committee, but they wore the country's colours on their kit. When they win, they hear Tchaikovsky, meaning that for many, they are Russia in all but name. Valieva was mesmerising today, even in practice, but there are now lingering doubts over whether we'll see her compete again on the Beijing ice that she's made her own. Laura Scott, BBC News, Beijing. Time for a look at the weather news now and Chris Fawkes is here. Hi Chris. Hi Clive. We had one or two issues this morning in parts of Scotland where we had some hill snow, caused some problems out on the roads and also strong winds that gusted to 70 miles an hour in the Western Isles. That was all from this little area of low pressure that's now exiting stage right. But if we zoom out in the Atlantic, we've got our next weather system waiting to come in to bring wet and windy weather our way this weekend. Between and betwixt these two, 
we're in relatively cold air, a ridge of high pressure building in. And what that will do overnight is it will squidge the showers. So increasing, we'll get clear skies, the winds will fall light and it will be cold with a widespread frost developing in many places. Now the lowest temperatures are likely in somewhere like Braemar. We could get down to about minus 10 degrees Celsius. And with the potential of a few showers coming into near coastal areas, there is a risk of some icy stretches to take us into Friday morning. But for many of us, a glorious winter's day is on the cards with plenty of sunshine both morning and afternoon. There'll be a few showers coming in off the Irish Sea and a few coming into Western Scotland. Northern Ireland, the cloud will thicken up as we go through the day uh, just ahead of the next weather system. And our temperatures, for the most part, pretty close to average, about six to nine degrees Celsius. On into the weekend weather prospects then, the weather turns much more unsettled with outbreaks of rain spreading in off the Atlantic. Lots of showers for Scotland and Northern Ireland, but at least there'll be occasional bright spells here. The heaviest rain looks set to move into parts of Wales and Western England. Temperatures around eight or nine degrees Celsius, perhaps a little bit milder than that in Northern Ireland. Now the second half of the weekend will see another area of low pressure develop. This brings outbreaks of rain and increasingly strong winds possible, particularly towards the south of the UK. But I have to say there is some uncertainty about exactly where this is going and the whole low could end up being a little bit further northwards. The strongest winds likely to come through as we go through Sunday evening and Sunday night. That's the latest weather, Clive. Chris, many thanks. Chris Fawkes there. And the reminder of our top story this evening. Boris Johnson meets British troops in Poland as he warns the crisis over Ukraine could be entering its most dangerous phase. That's it. I'm back at 10, now on BBC One. Time for the news where you are. Have a very good evening.